Looks like we're out of luck. Maybe we should try again in the morning. Hello? Hello. Sorry to call at such an hour, but we're looking for the friar. Oh, um, yeah, hello. I'm, I'm Friar Samuel. Uh, sorry for the, uh, the scanty attire. I was having a little soak in the tub. We are very sorry for the interruption. Oh, no, no, no. Don't worry about it. Don't worry at all. I was starting to turn into a prune anyway. Um, come in. Uh, shall I get some tea on? Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast. Um, it's another quarantine special, unfortunately, so uh, we're going to be doing this one over um, Discord. Um, and I'm joined by a couple of people. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, um, Tim, maybe you go first. Hi, I'm Tim Baker. I play Gabriel Barossa, who's one of the generals in the league. Okay, and Phil, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Phil Forrester. Um, I play um, Ezreal, who's uh, one of the adjutants um, of the High Guard armies yeah and i i should say that me and phil we go like way back to both our starts of empire um phil is a very early supporter of the podcast so um very very in a formal way thanks for doing that phil and it's great to have you on the show finally basically no worries yeah cool um right so like i was just saying before we went on we have a very uh, limited amount of might well knowledge of what the empire military game is um would anyone like to give a kind of a crack at an overview of what it, the, the military game is? Can I start on that one? Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Okay, so you've got two basic areas of the military game, what I think of as uptime and downtime in my head. The sort of uptime game is where ultimately you know, we go through the Sentinel Gate, we go on battles that have an impact on the campaign and give you know, a thousand people a huge great fight. And then you, obviously the smaller skirmishes as well. And then the downtime game, you've got the movement of armies, which is often described as a giant board game, or some people call it risk on an epic scale, where we are each general's got one army. They can give orders to that army legally. Literally no one else can, which causes many arguments. And they, those armies get their sort of performance modified by the actions of a huge number of people in the field, a lot of which is quite invisible, I think. Mm -hmm. right that's right i think that's that's a that's a good starting point let's start with the downtime side of things which kind of mix, mixes in with the the kind of in character stuff when you're actually at an event um so okay so how, how let's start off how do you get involved in the military game right so you what's your first step to try and get involved you know so if you're interested in what I, the sort of the big the movement of armies the strategy game, then mm -hmm. there's a misconception that you've got to be a general or an adjutant <clears> to be involved, and that's been proven to be wrong on a number of occasions. But I think, obviously, some people have got titles that don't want to have to compete for them. Have got a vested interest. So, a, so a general is a title is an adjutant title as well that you need to be voted into. Is that like a? Um... Mm, no. It's, okay. Um... It's it's kind of like a it's it's not even really I guess I guess it's not even really an imperial title. It's um, from a proxy point of view, it's there so that if the general dies on the battlefield during the event, um, there is someone around who can give orders um, to the army um, that go through the um, that go through the the, um, the imperial offices and the and the magistrates etc and that side of the game so that an army isn't left dwindling during downtime uh, yeah and it's it's an interesting position i think because they are officially a proxy or a type of proxy but they've got other authorities that the proxy for say a senator or a cardinal won't have because the, the really critical difference is if a general dies at a game then the proxy automatically takes on the title until there's a new election, which senators could do at any time. Yeah. So does that mean <clears throat> effectively that the the general is basically the? Uh, I'm assuming this is the same in every nation. Are they an elected official, or is there another way to do in each nation? So every general that's one of the few areas where all the nations are the same. Every general is appointed by the senators, and it has to be a unanimous decision by the senators mm -hmm. of every single time. And they appoint the proxy themselves, which the senators might try to exert political influence over, but they can't make them. Interesting. So, so it's the Senate that decides the, the general. Does that mean that they have to choose between candidates from a certain nation or can that be any, you know? No, very much. It's, it 
has to be your own nation. So league senators will pick the league generals. And so I, I don't want to sort of mention too many in character controversies, but yep. there was one really notable one in the league where during one of the elections, in fact, one of mine, um, I ceased to be general for a year because another nation had put some wonderful pressure on our senators and told them that I was out of favour. And you know, the sort of horse trading went on between the senators of different nations. That's insane. That is absolutely insane. That's amazing. Oh my God. It, it, it's still, there's the thing about the political game that scares me is that like I'm not smart enough to keep up with these people. Uh, I get the feeling like you don't want to play uh, checkers with someone if they're playing chess. Do you know what I mean? I think that politics has a lot in common with trading, and I think a lot of it is legwork. Yeah, I. No, I agree, and I think there's certain things with um, with getting slightly off topic. I will bring it back, but the um, the idea of like my character going through like a political landscape is something where once you get like a cause or something that you believe in. It doesn't become work after that and it's a lot easier to put in that legwork and try and like you know become the the political force that you want it to be and you'll probably develop by doing that anyway right? absolutely and i think navarre has had a lot of that um classically for example the Athaven is the great lost cause of navarre mm -hmm. and and the valorn fight mm -hmm. and some of the navarre generals that we've had in play have been people who haven't necessarily been brilliant strategists or amazing fighters what they've been very good at is saying look I really care about this issue that is very important to my nation. If you put me in that tent in the military council, I'll go and fight our corner. I'll go and make those other generals pay attention to this thing we care about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I, I think that's a great observation about Navarre specifically, because um, it's one of the things that's nice about being a Navarre is the unifying factor of the Valorn being the absolute enemy, right? Like it's the one talking point where if you, you know, like, I don't think I've met many Navarre, if any, that have said, no, that's not our main concern. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, anyway. So let's go back to the military game. So t tell me about like, so you're a, you're a freshly elected new general, all right? What what's mm -hmm. what's your first day look like? What what are you, you going to be doing? Where are you going to be going? Who are you going to be meeting? And what kind of actions are you going to be taking while oh, you're there at I, the event? Okay, so I, I remember being a new general for the first time, and it was terrifying. Because um, I mean, I, I think when I first got the job, I remember I remember that feeling. It's a bit like going to like the slaughtered lamb pub in. Uh, you know, you kind of you walk into this pub that you don't know anybody, and all the locals look around and look at you like you don't belong. Right. And <laughs> that, that was that feeling of like I'm the new guy in the tent. Oh God. Um. But yeah, you're, so the, what tends to happen, your election is always Friday. At the, the way that general appointments work, you're appointed for a year and you cease to be general on time out of your fourth event, effectively. Okay. And then there is no general at time in at the next event. So at that point, unless, they, unless your senators elect someone, no one goes to the meeting. So your senators are under huge pressure to elect somebody in time for the first meeting on a Friday, which is usually eight. 8 p.m. Friday night. So that's why it's like uh, I think I think the one that we saw the election that I saw for a general in Navarre was straight after standing. So that makes a lot of sense, right? It was like the, yeah. one of the first actions on after the group meeting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the hot bits of advice I'd give to anybody that wants to be a general is never leave it to the event where the election happens. Because I mean, the, some of the more brutal senators I've known have been very upfront at saying if you don't talk to me the event before the election to at least introduce yourself and say this is coming up i want you to consider me you want in with a hope yeah, and because they want to have, they want to almost have yeah, made their yeah. or they want to have certainly got their shortlist down before the event because they've got very little time to consider and it's vital for their nation that you and particularly if you've got not very many generals in your nation you've got to get those people really spot on um and the uptime battles, because there's nothing legally that says the generals of your nation have to be in charge when you go through the Sentinel Gate. So it could be you, it could be anybody that takes charge of your nation. Um, we'll get but, to some of the we'll get to some of the the, the fighty stuff in a bit, but how oh, sorry, they, how, no, 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 it's good. I, I want to talk about it. Um, but the uh, who decides? Because I've been around the field. I've been around like the command square, you know, an auxiliary, right? Um, so you have field marshals and you have generals. How has the field marshal decided on those on those battles? Okay, so that at the at the muster, that Friday night meeting is all about the battles in up in uptime. Mm -hmm. um, so you choose between which battle opportunities you're going to take, and there'll usually be a choice between three and five. And Tom Hancock's probably talked about this before, I think. And 
that will be quite a controversial argument sometimes. Uh, do you get where... the feeling? Do you get the feeling that they're designed to be difficult? Absolutely. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I think I think there are, there never is um, an easy choice. Although Tim, if you remember E four, the choice of battles was done like in super yeah. time. For, for we had some yeah, there was reason. one event in two thousand nineteen where we made the decision in record time and everyone was absolutely stunned. There was almost no argument and we'd virtually got the, a two hour meeting wrapped up in 20 minutes to half an hour. Do you know what? We, I think PD were gutted. <laughs> yeah, dev, they had a terrible weekend. Absolutely devastated by the result. Um, yeah, let's go back a little bit then. So, because we're actually, we, we nicely, we skipped one stage in, in, in our storytelling there. So you're a, new, you're a new general, you show up, all these new people. Like, I'm assuming everyone's in character so some people are more friendly than others and mm. but I, I, I did you go there with a game plan were you like okay well this army i know pretty much what i would like to see this army do did you go into the meeting feeling that way so every gen was a little bit different i i went in with a very solid strong game plan of what i wanted which at the time when i first started was quite controversial and over time has become less controversial um so that uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, what I what I wanted to do was, well, as in the, it, the intention is less controversial. What I wanted to do was be quite strategic in my thinking and make and play the board game to win kind mm. of thing. I, I wanted to. There's there's a quote on the wiki in the in the League Military Concerns section by some you know, fictional League general of the past, which is all intended to sound quite ruthless and strategic, like sort of you know, winning victory by being good at strategy and you know, not caring about making impressive speeches, just winning at all costs. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's, that's a really fun archetype to play. You know, you're going to go in there and you're going to have Dawn talking about glory and Navarra talking about the Valorn, and people are making impassioned speeches about the things they care about. And you go in there as the ruthless son of a bitch who just thinks, yeah, I don't care. Nice you care about the Valorn, but, well, we can do that tomorrow because we can't do it now, and I'm going to be the one who gives you the bad news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's really good fun. I know there was one event, 2018, I think, where... I had a lovely argument with Owen, who plays Brenos, one of the Navarre generals. Yep, yep. I know him well. And um, he was making an am he made a really good speech. It was a really impassioned and quite strategically sound sort of argument for why he wanted to go into the Le Avon and do quite, sort of execute quite a long term plan. It was going to cost us a lot of resources. And before the meeting, loads of people had said, no, we're not going to do that plan. That's that's a terrible plan. It's strategically, it's awful. And then he made the speech and it was absolutely wonderful. It was heart rending. So at the end of it, all these people had been saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to tell Navar no. All went, actually, no. We, and they still all afterwards said, yeah, we didn't agree with him. But nobody wanted to be the bad guy and stand up and say, you can't have the thing that you want. And I think I did. because. It felt like, well, I still think you're wrong. You're going to be really annoyed with me. He nearly mm -hmm. stabbed me. It was great. <laughs> um, I remember him pointedly giving away his sword before he came over to talk to me because he couldn't trust himself to be carrying it. It was a lovely moment. But um, I think you get, do get those things happening where people are making a really impassioned argument for something their nation cares about absolutely. And it, create, it forces other people to make role-playing choices and I think that's one of the areas where I really like the military game is it takes these sort of talking points, and these opinion points and points of friction, and it forces them out into the open. And I think that's a I think that's a really interesting like idea that playing the game and, 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 and having all these kind of like characters and their motivations playing a what could be a very bland and dry board game is kind of a cool it's a cool way to RP, right? Absolutely, I, that's what makes it. I think you've got the room full of really interesting people. You've got, you've got, you've got twenty six, twenty six people, all with an agenda. Oh my god, twenty six! Yeah. I didn't think well, it was that that's, many. No, the, well, the, you've got twenty six generals, then you've got the adjutants, and then you'll have the, the war mage. The war mage. Yeah, Who's the, the war mage? Oh, it's one of the best jobs in the game. Oh, it's also the worst job in the game, um, yeah. other than maybe the empress. Um. So the, the war mage is appointed by Conclave as their advisor to the military council. So it's, it's the one person on there that's not appointed by senators. They're appointed by Conclave on a mass vote. So that's a huge world of politics all of its own. Yeah, Conclave as well. That's interesting. 
Because they're a kind of separate body entirely, right? Well, you'd like to think so. Absolutely. And that creates an amazing conflict for the War Mage, because the War Mage has got a vote on the Military Council, same as the General's got, even though they have no army. But the Military Council is massively reliant on the War Mage to sort of organise things with the Conclave. Um, one of the things that's happened as the, time, as the game has gone on is that the difficulty level has gradually ramped up for one reason or another. And we're very reliant on not just using the armies, on using military units, on using rituals, buffing those armies or those military units. We're it's, reliant it's on in, it, It's in a huge amount of like the uh, the winds of war when they get released. There's yeah. loads of like, and when you're reading them, there's loads of like, and a boon happens, then these guys show up, and then this happens. And you're like, there's got to be like a military conclave type collab, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's, a, there's a player who's, and he's not as active anymore, um, who was a war mage some years ago, who really changed the job. Because originally, I guess when the game started, Conclave wasn't as organised. By definition, you've got like loads of players who don't know each other. The big covens that can pull off big rituals now didn't really, mostly didn't exist. So much smaller magic was really possible. And then we've got a very ambitious war mage that got in, who was determined to be super organised. And... So if he worked with the military council and the subsequent war majors have been very similar, well, what they've tended to do is go in with a battle plan from the outset saying, right, these are the big things that are going to happen. And then they spend their whole event coordinating between military council meetings and what the evolving strategy is and what Conclave is doing and rituals. And they work themselves to the bone. I mean, That sounds like a horrendous earlier. job. That sounds like you need a group of people to even attempt that. That sounds horrendous. Yeah, I mean, the last couple of War Mages, the current one as well, I think, um, have actually got a team where it's not an official position at all, but each of them has worked by having basically mates who go out there and help them do it. Because it, it's almost impossible to be really good at the job with, by yourself. Yeah, I, I think that sounds impossible, right? Yeah, it is. And it, also, the uh, meetings clash, the um, Conclave Military Council meet, meetings clash, and you can guarantee that both bodies will give you grief. So Conclave will tell you that you're not a good enough war mage because you're not going to Conclave. But Military Council will say you're not doing a war mage job because you don't go to Military Council. <laughs> and also, if you go to Military Council, you'll stay on top of strategy. But that means that all the people in Conclave who elect you and have probably got doubtless rivals for your job could all be politicking behind your back to get rid of you. Oh, layers upon layers. Yeah, let's move on from Proper the reasons. war mage. Let's move on from the <laughs> who else is in the who else is in the room? Let's forget that poor soul. So there. We've got the um the fleet master is relatively new. <laughs> uh he's currently one of the characters from the brass coast. Mm -hmm. And they tend to coordinate people with fleets working with various military things when you've got naval engagements. That's a lot less relevant now, but it was really important when we were at war with the Grendel. I'm still. I still think it's sad we're not at war with the Grendel. Really, um, I don't know how that happened. I think it's a damn shame. So, I mean, it's because we were horribly outnumbered. Yeah, I know. I know. But still, it's, it's still a bad deal. Yeah, I, I, don't, lot, I don't think there's, I can a, there's a lot of. Yeah, okay, you're not going. I, yeah, I, I, well, I, speak, I, yeah. I went to a player event um, at the end of 2019, sort of last sort of hurrah of getting to risk getting killed. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, there were a bunch of Brass Coast characters there, and I hadn't realised just how angry that with me they were. Right. And I got to the end of the event, and one of them went, "I can't believe we didn't murder you." I was like, <laughs> "What?" Um, apparently, they were blaming I, I think, me for the Grendel Peace Treaty. Well, I think there's something to be said about like certain topics where, like, not everyone's going to have an opinion on the Vlorn, not everyone's going to have an opinion on this. If you talk to anyone about the Grendel, they're going to have an opinion on it, right? It doesn't whatever oh, that might be right it's a talking point is the grendel so yeah um yeah yeah oh, I, I think well, we're just... while we're on the grendel uh, yeah, i'm going to share my theory on them so you know there's sort of four main barbarian tribes around the empire they're all kind yeah. of differently flavored and one of the things i remember sort of we're joking about some of the other generals a few years ago was that each of the barbarians has got kind of a strength and a weakness and you know, for the Yotun are they're massive heavy infantry, but they don't really do their ritual magic's a bit poor and they don't use archers, but they are super stompy and yeah. their armies are great. Um, the Thul use magic, the Druze are sneaky sods. And with the Grendel, everyone's a bit like, what's their thing? Is it the fact they've got navies? And we realise the thing with the Grendel is that they're basically like PCs. They are just, they're really clever and sneaky and they fight so much more tactically than everyone else does. And it is like, 
if you're playing a you no know, a tabletop role playing game, and they always say the downside the GM has always got is that you've got half a dozen players or whatever mm-hmm. using all using their brains against the one poor GM, and the Grendel is suddenly it evens things out. You've got these. I think they just let themselves have free reign with being sneaky and devious. I think the thing is, it's like uh, not to go too much into it, but like tactically, it makes a lot of sense, and those other things need doing. But the Grendel. <laughs> At, at some point, we've got to go back to the Grendel, basically. Like, oh, sure. Um, but they are glorious dickheads. Like, yeah, I love them absolutely. dearly. Yeah, definitely. Right, so uh, I've actually got a fleet, and I actually haven't done any fleeting with them. So uh, I, need to, I did some trading. That's about it. But maybe next season I might start um, doing some battles, maybe. Yeah, the problem is we haven't got a, it's harder to do battles now because we lost our only navy, and the only people we're at war with don't have the miser. Well, that's rubbish. What am I going to do with my fleet? Just trade. Trade. Yeah. <laughs> trade. I've been thinking. I've been thinking recently that I might swap it out for a um, uh, what's the religious one called? The oh, congregation. Congregations and and go go a bit go a bit religious, which I haven't done before, which could be fun. So uh, it's great fun. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, I think if, which if, of if, the seven virtues? That, if you are, if you're going for a congregation and go religious, don't do half-hearted. Go go, go all in with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe wisdom. That's yeah. Um, yeah, you heard it here first, folks. Um, I probably won't do it. I don't know. We'll see. It's oh, a long wisdom, way. Wisdom it's a long way I, away. I wonder if you say that because the, the motto of wisdom is do the thing. Oh, really? Yeah, no, wis, wis, people misunderstand wisdom. I think they people get the idea it's about being cautious and wise and clever. Whereas wisdom, as I've always understood it in the, in the way that in the game, is it's about doing something and learning from it so just talking about it or just thinking about it, it's not enough wisdom the way of wisdom is get in there and do a thing i really Virtue like that by action yep it's yeah great. that's a good point I, I i i like a lot of the virtues just because of how malleable they are you can fit them into a lot of spaces depending on what you want to do with them um you know motivation wise but anyway let's say focus gents we're talking about the military so Everyone shows up. Uh, is there anyone else in the room after the fleet master? Is that it? Quartermaster. You've got the quartermaster. Oh yes. Oh, I would get her. And, and and then the person who keeps all the generals in check, the herald. Yeah, Katia is the character. Hold on. Yes. Hold on. What does um, the quartermaster do? So they the last two have been Navarre, and the and the current one's quite new, but she looks like she's really good. And the one right. before her was very very top notch. Um, Brennan was it? Brennan? Yeah, Brennan. Not a Brennan. No. Brendan uh, Brackensong. Uh, Brendan Brendan Brackensong. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So they've a little bit like the warm warm age, but not quite the same. They've got a job that can be really hard work, but you could get away with being lazy if you wanted to. You don't. You're not quite under as much pressure, but I think you do see the difference when you've got a hard working one. They're responsible for resupplying armies, basically, um, which sounds dull. But... Is that? through attrition or is that through eating food like how what's the what is the mechanic on that like what what is it so the way there's it's one of the things if you only if you are going to play the general game there's two wiki pages that are worth reading Mm -hmm. uh one of them's called on war and the other one is about campaign results and those two basically give you all the nuts and bolts of how armies work and how you how you give your orders and how if two armies or a bunch of armies meet how the result is calculated and that's and anyone who's going to be general, I think, has got to, really needs to read those two pages right. if they have any interest in strategy at all. And what's, what's really critical is that you cannot get away without losing soldiers. As soon as you fight, you lose hundreds of troops every, every season. Um, generally, what happens is an army will call, cause about 10% of its strength as a base figure before it gets modified to, an, to the enemy, enemy forces it's fighting. So if 5,000 troops fight you, you'll lose 500 troops. And an army, if it doesn't do any, if it defends for a season, doesn't get attacked in your own territory and everything goes well, resupplies a tenth of its own strength every season. Right. Okay. Um, which means you can end up, if you fight for three seasons against equal forces and you resupply for one, you gradually, your army starts to attrit away and it eventually just gets destroyed. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, think, and we've got yeah. certain armies in the, in the empire that have been really bad at resupplying that have ended up chronically under strength for a long time. And, that, and that's the thing of note that if you get below that army gets below a certain strength, it's automatically disbanded. Yeah, and then your right. general ceases, ceases to be a general because they've got no army to be a general of. Um, and also, massive. You're looking at about, if I remember correctly, I'm an army, and you no know, 
for context, I think no to upgrade a normal mil- normal military unit would cost you two wanes of mithril, mm. and a wane is probably a good year of work for a lot of players to get one wane. And this is mithril to make armies, but with a mithril to resupply them faster. What's called emergency resupply, as well as your basic getting a tenth of your strength back. You know, you're re-equipping extra soldiers, and but it's hellishly expensive. It's something like one wane for twenty extra soldiers, and most of that then gets organised to the quartermaster. It used to be that if you supported an army, you got half the resources you would get for having it going off and doing paid work, which is you no know, simulating raiding, bodyguarding, mm. whatever it's doing. So there was a real opportunity cost to supporting an army. You've got you no know, half the value of resources that anybody else in the field is getting. Wow. Whereas what they've changed it now is that there's a section of the Senate budget for the Girdon, which is a pot of cash, and the Senate gets to decide how much it is in any given season. And that is divided equally between everyone who assigns a military unit to an army that's eligible. And the quartermaster is the one that decides who's eligible. So the quartermaster might just pick five armies in a season and say, right, these five have got the gird on assigned. If you're a military unit, join as one of them. You get paid. If not, you don't. And it's a real gamble because if that season there's, say, 200 thrones in the gird on and only 50 people assign their military unit to, a, to an appropriate army, you all come out absolutely minted. <laughs> yeah, okay. And Gabriel, um, Tim, sorry. It's all right. People <laughs> <laughs> it, do it to me all the time. Your, yeah. Isn't it your army as well that um, had that magic ritual done to it so that if a, you can get more from a military unit if they... Join yeah, you don't get more cash so, so. if you support my army. Um, so there's, there's a ritual called Bound by Common Cause. And some years ago, one of the other players, who was the Archmage of Autumn, organi- had this project where he wanted to get together an absolute ton of Ilium to cast a permanent army enchantment. And he wanted to cast Bound by Common Cause on, on an army. So that army would be permanently enchanted without having to re-enchant it every season. And That's awesome. It is. It, it is a mammoth project. And the only thing is that hadn't occurred to me at the time is that of, the, of all the rituals that he could cast, the one that he picked, Bound by Common Cause, is the only one that's got a permanent role-playing effect. So a lot of the others, like there's one called Clarity and Master Strategist, where when it's cast on, you have this kind of brief flash of a few seconds where you feel like you can feel like what all your soldiers are doing at that moment. You feel like you're sharing their minds and it makes you a brilliant strategist for the season because you're very at one with your troops. That's awesome. That's cool too. That is really cool, but it only, that only lasts for a few seconds. It's a fun, brief bit of role-playing. Mm-hmm. Bound by Common Cause has got this obsessive role-playing effect on it where you become obsessed <laughs> with the perfection of your army. Um, <laughs> so a, a thing that I've been enjoying for the last several years that this has been on my army is that you know, normally it gets cast on someone, it's on them for one season, and then they go off and live their normal life. Whereas my poor character has had sort of about five years now of being constantly enchanted to be obsessed. The protection I, I, been... as well. Can you imagine being a, a lion infantryman in your army or woman? Uh, would just be hellish, right? Because you're just constantly like straighten that buckle. Let's march again. Drills, more drills. <laughs> well, the good thing is that part of the obsession is making your is in making sure your army is well equipped and well supplied. So I imagine that all the people in my army at least have got good boots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, he probably is a pain in the bum. Right. So you're at the table. I've seen the big table. It's really mm-hmm. cool. It's like the map of the known world in, it, in, in the Empire or in beyond, right? And there's also little tokens on there. Are they, is that like one token and army? That's yeah. it. So we normally lay out, where, we know where all ours are, and we tend to lay out a bunch of coloured ones for the barbarian armies, so we are our best guesses to where they all are as well. Right. So when you first go in there, I guess going back to that, um, as well as all these other people that are in there, you'll get handed a wedge of paperwork. And that stuff is a bit of a lifeline, if you're new, to be honest. And it's, like, it's vital anyway. One piece of paper will be details about your army, and it'll tell you where the army is, what your current strength is, um, what orders are available to you. Um, you might have various other bits of fluff text as well. No, oh, that's probably the wrong term. But you know, it has quite a lot of really quite important information about your own position and what you've got available to you. Right, and you'll you'll also get handed um, a series of very flavorful texts about the different battle opportunities that are happening that weekend. So you want to rapidly read through those and assess them because before the event on the wiki they put a kind of a brief overview of roughly what the battles might be, 
Hold on, they don't you, tell you all detail. You get a detailed version for your army, effectively. Exactly. So everyone gets the same one when they get in there for, the, for these opportunities. So before the battle, everyone might have been told like a little sort of one paragraph. No, th- there's going to be a battle opportunity conjunction in, I don't know, Leath Avon, say, and it might be told it's to fight the Yotun. Mm-hmm. But you won't mm-hmm. really know what you're going to get out of it. And then the piece of paper you get given when you're in there will now give you all the nuts and bolts. So it might tell you, right, this battle is to go in there and take a hold of an objective, it's to kill this ritualist, it's to do this, that and the other. And it will give you a series of penalties and bonuses you might get. So it might tell you if you don't take this opportunity at all, something terrible will happen. Um, so we had one of them where there was a bridge that the Grendel were going to destroy between two territories. And if we didn't go and take the opportunity, their sappers would destroy that bridge and there would be no way of moving armies between those two territories ever again. Right. That sounds um, pretty important. It was pretty horrendous. horrendous. So we took that one. Um, and so you uh, might are we... told... yeah. yeah, sorry, go on. Please go ahead. I was going to say, you might also get told there's an advantage to taking it. So that one was a, if you don't do this, there's a penalty. And sometimes it's if you do do this, there's a benefit. So you might get a battle where we had one in Barushka where some local miners had holed up with their stockpiles of mithril. And they told us, no, if you come and rescue us, do these rituals for us, we'll hand over our stockpiles and resupply your armies for you. Hmm. How do you get battle opportunities, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> so what you need to do is get your armies involved first. The way that PD will tend to do it, and they've been very explicit about this now, is they will create battle opportunities for you to choose from based on where your armies are involved. Right. So if you want to have an opportunity to go through the Sentinel Gate and kick in the Valorn, you need some armies to go to where there's a Valorn and you know, get involved there. And then the opportunities will rapidly happen. What you don't want to do is you know, wait for an opportunity to come to you. If you want, if you want one, you get your generals to make sure you can get, make sure you get one. Okay. So, and are the, how are these? Uh, so, you say there are like between three and five. Or did I hear you say that? Yeah, normally. Yeah, yeah. And you normally have to pick the best of a bad bunch. <laughs> right. So they're like, there's there's always a wrong answer, um, and that's going to happen. Do you pick? Yeah. Saturday and Sunday battles, basically, yeah. effectively on the Friday. Yeah, yes. so when you look and at that, yeah. I was going to say that generally, when you look at the battle opportunities on the, the Winds of War, it will tell you um, which day um, that the prognosticators of the Sentinel Gate have said that the opportunity will be there for us to walk through. Yeah. Uh, the important thing is that PD need to know a load of things on the Friday so they can plan the battles for uptime. Right. Yeah, so, that's a lot of sense. what we, the first thing you decide is which battle opportunities you're taking, and which day you're going to do them. Because sometimes they're fixed, sometimes they can be either day. So once you've decided which battle you're doing on which day, you decide which nations are going to which battle, trying to divide those by force waiting to make them even. And then you decide from those people that are going, you pick a field marshal for each day. And the field marshal is usually a general, but legally there's no reason why they have to be. Oh, so certain very keen people who want to get into field command put themselves forward to field marshal. Um, that's it's harder because the, the generals are more likely to pick someone they know in the room. So if you want to be a field marshal and you turn up and they don't know you from Adam, the chances are they'll pick somebody else. But it could, for example, be a, an adjutant or just a passerby, right? Like it could be anyone. Absolutely, literally, yeah. you could walk in there to the next event and get made field marshal if you'd put your hand up at the wrong time and. No, yeah. everyone's mood, the mood takes them. That would be hilarious. So you'd have to be like, what? Why didn't? Why me though? You know, like uh, it's got to be a bad one if they're sending you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you I, do I have that. Know. You have battles yeah. where no one wants to be field marshal. Um, yeah. If, particularly if we've had a really um, contentious argument about which battle opportunities we're going to take. Yeah. Because um, everything's you. You all ultimately, it's all decided by a vote. And every general, the war mage, get, gets a vote on this. And if they've picked a battle that you don't give a stuff about, you really, really wanted to go, go and do a particular battle, and the, the military council decided they're not going to do that battle at all, and now they've voted that your nation is going to go and take part in a battle where you just don't want to be, which does happen, you've got no interest at all in being field marshal. The main interest you've often got is, well, can I get my nation out of there with the minimum number of casualties? Right. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, the um, I'm kind of curious about, like, 
I, I, I find the just watching the field marshals and generals, like when, when it's the, the time to go for battle, right? Like you all rock up there with each of your nations. How much, like, because it, it's, it's, a, it's a great sight to see is all those people all dressed in their kit, all ready to go with the armies lining out. Like that's a lot for anybody to kind of take on as a, a role or responsibility. I mean, I can't mm-hmm. even imagine what it's like being the person at the head of that, you know? I think yeah. yeah, I think I think that's where that um you have different elements of of your own character and your own self that you need to be aware of. So you could be a fantastic military strategist, but you've then got to you don't have to, as Tim alluded to earlier, go onto the field as a general. But I don't certainly in the in the in the year that I played last year, I don't believe there was any generals who didn't go onto the field when it was time to to play um but you have to be yeah there has to be something about you to be able to lead people in a onto that field and stand there in the at the front and it seems though misty field and see all those orcs about to come and (laughs) see you with a foam stick (laughs) yeah 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 the pressure is immense actually i think being a field marshal I've, i've only done it once and in the event that i did it half my group died um right and it was, I mean, it was a really epic thing that has shaped my whole character arc. But that particular battle was one where our scouts gave us quite bum information when we were fighting. And it was not a site before where we are now. It was very heavily wooded. And the army got split up. Half of the army hit the objective without the other half. And they had kind of a window of opportunity to take, basically take this hill kind of thing. Um, so they took it and took horrendous casualties doing it. So they won the battle. Um, by getting in there at that timely moment, so you got, like a, they, you got a pyrrhic victory out of it, basically. Exactly. Well, it was a thing where it was a good thing for the empire, um, and not that it was the marches in the league that really that hit this place and both took horrendous casualties on that day. And it's a quite a devastating thing when you think, yeah, well, I went out there with these people and um, I've brought us success to the empire, and I'm just looking there and going, yep, my group went out. There were twelve people. There's six of us now. So I quite like military like history. I watch like videos on battle tactics and famous battles throughout history. And I've always been fascinated by the the because you watch something like Alexander the Great, right? And some of his maneuvers and all this stuff. And the kind of idea of well, how much control and communication did did they actually have at that point? And just watching it at Empire, and by mind we don't have horses or or big signals, but it seems from an outsider point of view to be Everyone meets up together and someone says, you go around the left, you go around the right, <laughs> me and you, we're going to go up the middle. And then when we do this part of the objective, we'll have another chat about it. That seems to be a lot of the, the tactical elements. Am I, am I, am I oversimplifying I think, it? No, no, you're not, no, not a million no. miles wrong. <laughs> no, he's, not, he's, not, he's, not at all, he's not at all. There's no, um, there's no fancy flag waving or... Um, you know, semaphore or anything like that. It's it's we'll get to a certain spot on the field. The field marshal and the command group will assess where we are and then dispatch runners if they need to change the the plan. Uh, yeah, but but I mean, nine, nine, nine times out of ten, there is a plan that was agreed um, at eleven o'clock. Um, yeah, I mean, I not, think there's before. a bunch of factors that give you victory or defeat at Empire, and very few of them come down to you no. Know, one person was great waving their sword about. Um, I think a lot of what decides whether you win or lose happens before you ever walk on the battlefield. Yeah. And some of, some of the stuff is what happens on a Friday night, how you divide the nations. Have you sent the right nations to that fight? And then, what? because going back to what happens when you have your, as a general, after you've devi- decided what forces are going, where your field marshal are, the field marshal will usually then say, well, in fact, almost always, will say, right, well, we're having to have a meeting on the night before the battle, where they get a briefing from one of the NPCs that PD sent in called the War Scout, who tells yeah. you about the terrain, who you're going to fight, that sort of thing. Um, and then you try and make your plan based on that. And the plan will be made by the field marshal and usually the captains of the various nations that are going to go with them. So those are quite fun meetings to be part of. And again, you don't need to be a general there. Usually, if you're anyone of any military authority within your nation, you can blag your way in. And yeah. They're often held in the main military council tent as an unofficial sort of late night meeting. And there you can often tell just watching that meeting whether the battle is going to go well or badly. 
Oh, that's good. That's very comforting for all the frontline troops. Um... Well, I mean, I mean, the thing <laughs> is, the th just go and see is... if you're doomed or not. The Friday night. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. I mean, I mean, when I when I became chapter captain at E2, um, I went to that 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 first meeting, and I was there with my just writing absolutely everything down that was being said and the plan and draw the map and this that and the other, and then um, went back to the chapter. Um, and most of most of the guys that take the field and, and lady that take the field with me were off doing other things. And I actually couldn't talk to them about the plan until literally as we were getting kitted up um, and ready to sort of go to go to the muster and go through the gate. So um, it is challenging to, to re relay all that information to the to the right people. Well, I mean, I, I've, I've been running as a auxiliary and um, I can speak firsthand that messages definitely don't always get through they get misinterpreted by the time you get the message to someone they may just turn around and tell you to bugger off because that there's no chance that you're going to move or do anything at that point you know like it's 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 difficult to kind of uh, get a, a full understanding of what's happening around you especially when you get to move around the battle a lot and see what's going on yeah i mean i love that it for, for years before i did larp i was a reenactor doing medieval right. reenactment and did a lot of battle reenactment. And there's historically been a little bit of friction between the hobbies of people looking at things differently. And a thing that I guess I hadn't got, I mean, I, I did reenactment for like 20 years. And almost all the shows you do in front of the public are fought to a script, usually. And they're normally fought in a big, nice open field so the public can watch you. And you very carefully position your units to get them good lines of sight so the public can see this, that, and the other. And as soon as you start fighting an actual battle where there's no no spectators it's just going to be fought like a no total raw war writ large mm. your your ability to maneuver your unit you you learn incredibly quickly or or your unit does badly and it's a, it's a wonderful experience at learning what a medieval battlefield is like more than reenactment ever was for me ironically so even yeah. though there's orcs and people casting spells I feel like I'm getting far better handle on what it's like to try and communicate with people and move a unit you can't see no, when, when you when you call for reinforcements and you're deep in the woods, are you going to get them or not? And is the as you say, is the order going to go from a runner that arrives to the people that could help you, where the order is going to get ignored and you're left to it, die? It's also like um, there's what I like about it is like the route is very oh. real. Like, yes. uh, uh, and it's because it's the, I, I would say, and this is I haven't done any reenacting, but in LARP you have an awful lot of investment in your character not dying. Okay, like no yeah. one on the goes on the field. Well, okay, I was about to say a dumb say. I've known people that go on the battlefield to die, so that's not that's not strictly true. But most people are going on the battlefield that day, and then they want to get back again. So mm. yeah. if if a unit is faced by unbelievable odds, well, a lot of people will run, and other people, if they do stay, they will die. So there's like a um, yeah. I, I remember just the first few times when I was monstering, walking past like armored clad knights and looking down at them and they're, they're kind of on the floor and i'm like wow that's a that's a character death and feeling quite poignant about it it's um it's an interesting yeah. aspect of the game I, I think it's one of the things i think you also see though is the hero factor where again i don't think it's necessarily down to someone's martial skills their ability to swing the sword but there's an inspiration factor there's certain people that when they're faced with terrible odds will respond differently and they have a big impact on the people around them um, and yeah. i don't know how you feel about name checking people but there's a couple of people i can think of that are really good at the way that they will just if you think they'll be around. if you think they'll be fine with it it's okay it's more like if people would be ticked off that you mentioned them that's the only thing if you're friends with them you think I, I, it's might, fine. I might embarrass my friends here but that's okay i'm gonna anyway. yeah it's fine and so there's, there's someone called maz who plays in dawn and i've she, met she's her a, she's awesome i shed a i shed a i shed a she part the throne god I shared yeah, I shared it. a battle line with her, and the reason why I know her is because we introduced ourselves because I thought how awesome she was, and now everyone mentions her name everywhere I go. It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like one that. of those characters where you're like, I meet her, we have a really good fight next to each other, we're complaining that we aren't fighting hard enough, you're having a really good time, and then everyone I keep bumping into after that keeps mentioning her name, and yeah, it's it's really oh, funny. Yeah. Anyway, she's, sorry, Tim. Sorry. No, sorry. No, she, she is an epic fighter. I mean, I, any time yeah. spent training with her is not time wasted. <laughs> um, but it's. I think the reason that she's so effective in battles isn't down to her prodigious sword skills. It's her personality. Um, 
I mean, I've I've seen a kind of a situation where a whole flank was collapsing and it was looking diabolical. You've got you now that situation described in the route and you're seeing bodies everywhere. And if you're a PC in that moment and you're thinking you're looking down the line, you're thinking we look a bit thin. We've just been hit by one column. I can see another wave of orcs coming. We're all going to die here. And it looks super bleak. And we had one battle where it was I was just watching and thinking, oh, I think this could be the end of the league here, you know. And then Maz turned up with about five mates and just piled straight in. It completely transformed the landscape. And it was the fact that she came in very aggressively and with almost no regard for personal safety, along with her mates that were fighting in her lands. Let's not do them down either. Um, And they basically charged over the top of our fallen people. I remember watching her fight four people with her legs either side of someone who was being physicked, trying to protect (laughs) them and the physic at the same time. And it was... This yeah, is exactly the great thing what? about it. Yeah, you, you have to earn heroism, right? Like, you don't get the, uh, I have this much stat in charisma or any of the rest of it, right? You, you really have to earn those moments. You can't roll moments. for it, yeah. You can't. No, yeah, absolutely. no. And <laughs> I think we... there's, but but like, say, um, I've just been creating, this evening, just before we started recording, actually, I was creating a new D&D character for a big campaign that I'm going to take. So it's kind of fun, like, looking at, like, character and rolling charisma and all that sort of stuff. But, like, it, at Empire... You 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 have to be inspired. But talking about the the charisma stat, like in D anD D, it doesn't have to be the most charming person to have a high charisma. You can be just a force of will if you want to. And I think those are very interesting yeah. things to RP and to see if you just start doing it. Sometimes how effective you you know there's there's depths to people that they don't think that they know. Like how much experience do we have in trying to rally a line of soldiers uh, against a, a, a rush of an enemy like i don't have the most experience but if you say the right words at the right time you can get a couple of people to stay with you you know absolutely and i think if you show that character it inspires a whole you, before you know it your three people can be 30 yeah. and before you know it you're not getting overrun you're, ch- you're chasing them down yeah, phil I, you were about to say something yeah i was gonna say that happened to me so at e4 when i became um, adjutant um and we went onto the battlefield on, um, I think it was Saturday. I think Natalia from the Tower Jacks was the field marshal, and mm-hmm. Koth, my general, was her second. So I was in the command group. And all Koth said to me was, if I see a problem, I'm just going to point you at it, and you'll deal with it. And and there's this thing about, I've, I've, I see it in all of the, the, the battles that we've been in, not so much monstering, because you're, you know, there's no there's no penalties if you charge a line of dawn and you get your head knocked off your shoulders but but when play when when you when the players are playing their own characters i always see that there's some sometimes there's some hesitancy mm-hmm. so there was we were we were moving up the field um there was um, we were by the cops which is the, the first group of trees which as you go through the sentinel gate um, and then as you go a little bit further up, there's like some hawthorn bushes and stuff it's a horrible place to get trapped in but there was a line of of, of monsters um, and a line of a line of players and the players weren't doing anything they were just they were just there they weren't moving and, and Koth said to me go and sort that out and I just barrel rolled straight through the players and started you know um, attacking attacking the monsters expecting to get cut down any minute thinking right that's it I'm, I'm gonna die but as soon as I moved forward as soon as there was some kind of impetus all of a sudden everybody was with me and we, and, and we got rid of them and mm-hmm. and 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 that's one of the, the things that you you know you probably need from the com- in the combat game if you're in a leadership role is that you need to be prepared to to step up and and do some crazy stuff to get people moving. Yeah, I think I think uh, bravery is a very real thing at Empire. I've seen like lines that look very strong be like like you're rattling a window and then the whole line will retreat. Right, like there's yeah. certain, but then I've seen small bands of uh, troops that have just been monstrous in holding or attacking or charging. It's like, I'm, I mean, I remember there was a, you know, the big field that goes through and there's a gate and it goes through into the coppice area of all the, the woodland <laughs> area. You know what I mean? Um, there was a deadlock there. And I remember we couldn't really get through it. And then everyone was holding back and there was a weird, like, standoff between two lines until dawn showed up the whole crowd opened and then the whole of dawn basically rushed through screaming with everyone cheering them on into this absolute bloodbath and i followed in what five ten minutes afterwards and they'd made this like um 
uh, what's the word for it? Like a bulge. There's a better name mm-hmm. for it than a bulge. Uh, a salient? Right a salient. salient. Uh, a salient. Um, and that, that was just a, we were in this salient. But I was just like, I can't imagine what it must have been like for the first few people to make this bulge happen. It must have been horrendous. But uh, it must have been great to be a part of. Well, the thing is, you, you know that if you're at the front, you're probably going to go down. And <laughs> yeah. therefore, so you yeah. have to know that your friends are going to step over and do it. Yeah. And it's, that's one of the areas where, again, you're saying you, you know you're going to win on, before the battle ever happens. Part of the reason is that if you go out there and you think, right, well, the nations that are fighting with us today are X, Y, and Z, and they're nations that aren't just good, because I'm, you can, people do have opinions about which nations are better than others. And you know, some of those are opinion, character opinions, some of them are wildly inaccurate or accurate. And, but if they're people that you trust and you've got really good links with, they have more like to have your back, it totally changes how the battle evolves. Yeah, yeah. yeah I totally agree. I think the. Um... I think there's a certain, like armies in Empire, just because of the game mechanics, uh, win if they're moving forward. If you're yeah. retreating, then you're taking attrition and you won't be able to pick your soldiers back up again and get them back into fight. If you're advancing, even if you're doing it and taking casualties, if you're still holding that advance, you're still more powerful, right? So, so that's why you've seen often uh, games, like especially ones that get into, remember that one last uh, 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 event, which was just, absolute anarchy where there were troops everywhere and it was just like everyone was running everywhere like it was absolutely bonkers like they're the sort of things when even though we were winning you could easily die just by be- falling in the wrong place and no one being able to get to you so i don't know it's interesting yeah yeah, yeah well certain nations like that kind of fighting i mean, some people like to have a very disciplined wall that you know trudges forwards some nations. I, oh, I don't know who you're talking about, Tim. How <laughs> how vague are one. you, Tim? <laughs> there what? is more than one. Well, well, well. <laughs> but, some, one, but then some of them like to be w. super maneuverable. <laughs> and, That's very true. And the, the maneuverable nations you know that the upside is when they're doing well, they do really well. When they do badly, it can go really horribly wrong for them because it's that thing you see. You see it in tabletop war games or on computerized war games. If you do a flanking action, by definition, you usually end up exposing your own flank. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is why I find interesting about the kind of heroic side of this, because uh, you, it, it, we all want to be heroes in our own story. Right. But sometimes mm. there's moments where if you do do a push, I remember one time I was really trying to get us to go and push and to help out another unit that was in a different area. And I was constantly yelling, give me like, give me 10, 10 dudes and we'll go and sort this out. Right. I'll just go over there and we'll sort of and the, the, basically I had to remember. By, by even pushing units away from somewhere else just to get this meaningless victory, you could potentially fall on an entire flank because we didn't have the troops there to support it. So there's kind of like a this. I love the big picture aspect to it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, I think and, there's so much going on that people aren't aware of at any given moment. Yeah, there was. I, I think it was certainly an eye opener for me at E4 being in the command group, just being out, just just not being in the thick of it all the time, just to mm. understand. It's cool, right? It's, the, there's a, it's a visual, spe- it's a visual um, spectacle, that's for sure. I think, I think when, you're, when you're in your unit and you're looking at like what's happening, you're very much focused on the immediacy. You want, you're, you're, this is for me anyway. When I'm in my unit and I'm looking around, I'm looking at who am I going to fight? Where is that fight going to be? How much support do we have? Who's in support of us? Like I'll literally be yelling, who's in our support? And I'll look over and I'll see, say a contingent of like high guard and i'll be like are you supporting us and i'll be like yep and i'll be like sweet good right then then i know what's going on when when you're a runner or part of this command structure you get to kind of walk around and see all the different nations and they are they behave very much like their nation briefs which is really weird to watch isn't it it's kind of like they're, they're all tooled up with the right gear for who they are but they they behave that way which is the the thing i find weirdest you know yeah, well, it's contagious, I think. I think if you've got some people doing it, it influences other people to behave that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen Navar like, move really fast, run away, move really quick in. And it's just like, they're the same people. It's like one of those... Um, what's the, what was that fit? There was that experiment where they had in the States where they split half the people up to be cops and half them to be prisoners. Um, uh, and then they became those roles, right? That's, <laughs> Maybe that's... that's- experiment yeah that's an extreme example of what i'm talking about but it's interesting to see how brief and uh the situation can often lead to those characteristics coming out in an army's maneuvering on a on a on a fictional battlefield 
Yeah. Well, especially because, I mean, any of us could lose our character and the next event, you know, you could go from being a Navari and you could suddenly be in Varushka and you've played Navar for two years. Suddenly you're in Varushka and you're fighting a completely different way and you wonder why. That's it, yeah. 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 Could you, could yeah. You... I'd be interested in whether that's a weapon uh, selection thing as well. Or there's something to be said about some of our more armor clad friends um, and how they might feel about it, right? Because it must give you a vibe putting on like plate, right? That's got to make you behave differently and think differently. And, you know, you're not going to charge as much because you've only got about what, a 10 meter charge range. <laughs> you know? I think, I, 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 I think laugh probably because it's. It's quite thin. It's not too bad, actually. Mm. I mean, I wear full plate and I wear it on a harness, so I, I don't tend to feel it. Uh, is that aluminium or is no, that it's, steel? It's steel. It's steel, but it's it's only it's only a couple of mil. It's not it's not very thick at all. But the harness carries all the weight. It's very it's very mobile. Um, it's a pain. Oh, it's a pain to put on. I have to get someone to put it on for me. Um, but um, and peeing, I'm assuming, is an issue. Uh, no, no, it's not. I mean, I'm a, really? It's, I'm, well, because I, I haven't got a leg harness on, I've just got um, it just goes up to my knees, and then I've, I haven't got any tassets, so I've just got a, a placard chest plate and, and full arms. And so that's that's always one of the things that put me off being one of those. Also, the uh, the the potential expense of trying to get kid that kid out that way. The two yeah, things that really I put mean, me off. That I mean, I've got a steel um, chainmail vest now, and that's that weighs way more than my plate does. Um, Right, yeah. Bungle's actually got a um he's got steel uh, chain as well. And I didn't realise the weight. Like especially in un uh, if you don't put a belt on with it, yeah. it just hangs yeah. off your shoulders. Yeah. Oh my god, it's exhausting wearing that. Yeah. But, uh, you get used to it though. You, yeah, you do. I think you, and, and, I, and I think that um I enjoy putting it on, it does make me feel really super powerful. Hmm. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. Change, change is how you walk. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, feel, you, you feel you're being pulled into the ground, yeah. so you feel more solid because you've got this extra weight, and suddenly you do feel like you know you are a different person yeah. almost. And, so yeah. it does have it's in some ways it's quite a handy characterization tool. Yeah. And archers leave you alone as well, <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> unless there's lots oh. of them, and then it doesn't matter how much plate you wear, and you've only got so many hits. I'm a war mage, and archers just they they just love the look. They sit, they take one look at me, and they immediately like focus in. You know, they just uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's why I've not, I've never given up the shield. I've never given up the shield just because of that. Like I'm a, I'm an auxiliary that runs a lot with a giant shield. <laughs> it's like uh, uh, safety first, right? <laughs> yeah. There's no point having a message that doesn't get through because the runner's dead. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and they also, they do definitely want to kill you if you're a runner. Like, if they get even a sniff of an idea that that's what you are, they really want to kill you, and rightfully so. So, um, join them. I really want to be a runner now. Um, yeah, so let's talk about, like, so you've had, you've had your battle. What's it like when you lose as a general? I mean, Pain doesn't happen to us as often because we're in Navarre and the League that have the best fighting record along with Dawn, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it, it is the, the main, it's not whether you win or lose a battle is not actually that bad, if I'm honest. Um, what matters more is when you've kind of got the character, high character deaths in your nation yeah. and you feel responsible for them. Yeah. Mm. If, you, if you've gone out there as the general, I mean, the League often goes out with about 20 to 30 people. Um, cause so many of our people fight as mercenaries. So the main league block is tiny, the smallest nation fighting block in the empire. And it's it's one of those. The weird thing about the league is like, I know because there are leagueish bodyguards in that that help out the Navarchers. Mm -hmm. Oh, not the Navarchers, the 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 healing block. But yeah. um, I really can't remember seeing the league on the field not as mercenaries, right? Like that's that's weird. I can't even think of one occasion where it's really. Like, oh, I'm like, oh, there's the league block. Well, because uh, 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 they're uh, all mercenary. Uh, mercenary is that even a word? Not. Also, the, the the national league block is. I, mean, I I am super proud of it, so I should probably not boast too much. But I, but I'm I'm insanely proud of them. I'm insanely proud of them all, because I think one of the things about the national briefs at Empire being so flavorful is I tend to think that different nations appeal to different players and what they want out of the game. And the league is not generally where you go if you're thinking, oh, I really fancy a good mosh all the time. I want to be a, a proper brutal fighter. I think, I think there's nations that seem more martial, that you know, have more of an appeal. And the league isn't grabbing those players by and large. So the people who make up our national block, by and large, aren't primarily fighters. 
and a lot of them aren't snappers for combat at all. We've got loads of people that go out there making taking advantage of the fact you can wear any arm and use a sword and buckler. Mm. And so they, they shouldn't be effective particularly. But I personally, I think they punch massively above their weight. Um, but part of it is that we practice quite a lot. We And what we practice in is not fighting skills. We practice manoeuvring. Mm and listening to orders so they're very good at being responsive tim i should caveat by way of saying that i haven't seen them probably because i haven't come into contact with them my experience has been fighting with navarre and then uh being a runner but pretty much solely just being the runner for dawn for some reason they always go dawn you get dawn go with dawn dawn's the people they're they're always fun dawn i I have some friends in Dawn and I've made friends in Dawn because of running there. And I, I really like them. Yeah. They're, they're a really good bunch. Um, I, there's certain nations I would love to kind of be like the league would be a fun person to run to. Obviously that they're, they're, they're kind of small, so it might be hard to find you, but um, like the marches, there's a military group that I would love to kind of find out how they operate. They're fascinating it's all, to me. It's all whistles. Yeah. And they're really mixed as well. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, it's, it's quite funny actually, because, um, the marchers do practice quite heavily at time in all their military, all their fighters. Yeah. And they are, hmm. they are really good on the field um, with their whistles. And they're whistles. devastating. They're devastating. They're devastating as, uh, even when they're monstering, yeah. they're still, if you bump into a whole bunch of pikes, they are, and especially when they're wearing heavy armor in the front line, it's yeah. how do you fight that? It's, it's a very tough group. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of the, they've got their strengths and weaknesses, same as every nation. I think it's one of the things you said earlier about how the equipment changes how you fight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, because they, they tend to go for the super heavy infantry approach, they're really good when they get into a fight. They're not as maneuverable as some nations, but yep. they play to their strengths. But that's, uh, but isn't, uh, that's kind of one of the fun things about it as well that they start to get reputations. So sometimes when I was when I was talking about like going into the woods and having certain nations as my support, sometimes I'm genuinely happy when I see who's there, right? Because I'm like, well, they're going to be really good for this specific job that they're going to do, right? They're going to hold, yeah. or they're going to attack, or they're going to charge when we uh, counter charge. Like I just think yeah. it's fascinating. Um, well, I think that's no. I said about the, coming back again. You know, if you're going to win or lose the battle before you get out there, sometimes you look at the force mix and you look at what the objectives are, and you go, "We've sent the wrong people." Yeah. Oh man! You know, if you've got a, if you've got a battle that's like occasionally we get objectives things like in these woods there's some guy with a chest running around that's got some secret orders in you've got to chase them down and you've got this free wheeling battle you're going to fight chasing someone in some woods and finding one target and if you've sent just pure heavy infantry they can have the worst time imaginable right because they're constantly the, the target's too maneuverable for them to actually catch in the open yeah yeah exactly and you just it, it sometimes becomes a hide is nothing. Um, but equally, you know, sometimes people send an entirely skirmish force and they go, right, well, this is a take and hold objective. Get to there and then hold this fort. And you send all the highly maneuverable people whose strength is their ability to outmaneuver the enemy and get to their flanks. And you told them, right, have a big f- frontal stand up fight. Uh, even just talking about it now with you guys has put me into like, a, I just want, like, I've been giving serious consideration to handing up my boots as part of an auxiliary and going back to my front lines again. Um, and it's like there's a real like uh, bloodlust is the wrong term for it, obviously, but there's a real excitement to going on battles, skirmishes, and generally just b- doing that physical part of the RP game that just gets my blood pumping. Even thinking about it, I think from a pragmatic point of view, though, just yeah. being ruthless in my leagueish manner, if you are thinking about wanting to play the military game and you're thinking that you'd like to do military command, I mean, a big part of that game is not the battlefield. A big part is the strategy game. But mm-hmm. for the field command game, being a runner is the best way to learn the job, probably. Coming- yeah, I like what I like about being an auxiliary, and this is me just advertising being an auxiliary, is it's a very small group of very nice, motivated, cool players. But it also mm. gives you a, a, an insight. You, basically, you have to go to the meeting on Friday. I'm not really a meetings person, so um, there's a, but you get to touch base with people. I think it gives you a. Uh, uh, possibly an unrivaled view of the battlefield because you got to you get to constantly move around and have a look at it. Um, me personally, I don't think I'm, I'm necessarily interested in this character to get into the military game. Maybe the next one. I have to be kind of think about that. But I have um, I'm elbows deep in some political stuff at the moment, so um, I'm gonna see how that plays out, and then then we'll start talking about maybe what happens next to my character. But right now, there's kind of like. I've got plot with um, in the political game, basically. Mm. Yeah, we'll see. Um, unless someone gets killed or assassinated, and then um, kind of, you know, 
<laughs> back to my own devices okay. again. So, so it sounds dangerous, like a confession. Now I've got to say, what yeah. <laughs> accidents happen all the time. Um, that is, and isn't the isn't your um, isn't your camp on Murder Alley? Yeah, well, I okay. It is Murder Alley until the happen the friendship cult came in and then called it like Friendship Avenue. And I was close just to stabbing people to make sure that it kept its name because I'm like. It's cool living on Murder Alley. It's not cool living on um, Friendship Avenue, basically. So, yeah, and it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's it's it's, it's really not that bad. <laughs> a couple of years ago, there was a new player who said they couldn't come into the league because they thought we were all too ruthless and villainous. And they're like, we don't have Murder Alley. <laughs> at least we don't have murder alley um i remember i threatened a player i don't know whether already i'm probably going over an old story but i threatened a guy uh because my last character was a very aggressive sort of chap but there was like a murder plot with like navari assassins going around and this guy just assumed i was a murder assassin because of how confident i was to threaten him in his camp with like all of his friends around him um and uh yeah, he, he had to be escorted to go home, right? Because he was that worried about me coming to shank him. Um, so, and that's a great Navari <laughs> strength to have. There's, there's, People yeah, might believe you're going to stab them. So, There's a funny anecdote that um, Anvil is like, it's like a safe place. People walk around with their swords and stuff, but you don't <laughs> have to. But my group always know when I'm going to visit Dave and the Ashbourne because I strap <laughs> a sword on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I strap well, a sword I, I, on it and make sure that I've got my sovereign specific. Well, dude, let me put it this way, right? Know. Like, I literally cleave someone in the middle of Empire, uh, right? And I, nothing happened to me. No one ran to the player's aid. Um, nothing happened, right? So the idea of safety in the middle of the day is still an illusion, right? There are people that are sat down having a like a hot dog who are much more interested in the hot dog than they are in saving your life and getting involved in something they don't want to be involved in. So yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I sound like I'm like an advocate for assassination, which I'm not by the way. Um, like Good denial. Yeah. I, I, I mean, oh, if I, if I got assassinated, like I always say, I would hope it was for the right reasons. Like I hope it would be like a compliment that I was important enough to have something needing to some you needed to bump me off it was the only solution right all the other options were done your best way to deal with with um Gellert would be to kill him that would be the way i would like to be assassinated you know just just go into the league and challenge all the bravos to a duel we won't kill you <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably dance so, you. i think andy from the orcs planet is joining the league next isn't she i think she he sorry he is, um yes. yeah. and uh yeah i'm like like he's fucking awesome. Like that is a, like that's a single-handed person that makes the league that much cooler. And Tim, I've really enjoyed speaking to you tonight. So that's also a very good uh, <laughs> sign for the league. But I've always um, I I haven't really had any interactions with the league over the time I've been playing. And this I, I don't know. There's there's well, just the, the weekend field. just isn't long enough. Yeah, <laughs> and I just want to get into it. You know. No, I I tend to think that though it's a, it has its advantages in a way in that at the moment. What limits how many people you can interact with is the length of the weekend. If your character dies, mm. you go do a completely different bit of the game. You meet whole new people, and it's great. I mean, I've kind of got plans lined up for well, if I if I die, I can go and play in this nation. I can meet a whole different other bunch of people. I I think this is something I need to start to generally get into my mind. Is the idea of maybe like uh, maybe getting my own tent? I could probably still camp in Navarre to be fair, but really making a go at potentially going to another nation um i've always liked the brass coast as like a second option i don't know whether that's something i would go for but um i don't know i like their vibe i like the people i've met in there so i didn't think that a good time to think about is if you have a group wipe because i mean i think empire is very much a group game and obviously you want to play with your mates most of the time so if you've got the really enjoy playing with if you all happen to die on the same day that's the time to seriously think okay let's actually think what what nations could be playing and open up options the main problem I have with that is that I've got a couple of our friends die a lot. One of them is indestructible and the other one's so sneaky that you're never going to catch him. That You're never going to catch him. He's going to be back there with the archer block a million miles away from anything that's at all dangerous. Poor He's going to live just, forever. You cursed the hell out of him just there. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. And he's still <laughs> going. There's no black yeah. magic in the world that can take that man down. He like We're going to need... I'm going to need to get like a whole bunch of chickens together and do some sacrificing just to try and 
plink away at that sneak armor he's got. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry. He's got some. He's got some new fancy kit, so the kit curse will get him. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well. I like your attitude there, Phil. He does have new kit that is way too fancy, and uh, he's got a. He's got a. He's got a reckoning coming, basically. You know. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, right, gents. Is there anything else that you want to add, by the way? Because I've been kind of rambling on. Have we have we glossed over anything that you want to talk about? I think from the military game point of view, what we haven't talked about a lot is the strategy and how people get involved in that. Because okay. I think that's an area where because I mean, we've talked a lot about uptime battles, and I think that it's easy to focus think that's a big part of being a general. Whereas really, that's the Friday night meeting and the battles. Mm. For most of us, what we spend most of our event doing is planning planning the wars of the empire effectively and that's where the most number of players get involved ironically because you get a lot of people who don't take the battlefield and you get loads of people who have an interest in it and the politics there is cutthroat and wonderful um yeah. i think the thing that i like about it as well is that the senators and the senate have no control over the military council other than from a financial point of view and they can refuse to re-elect you but yeah, they, but once you're once you're in, the synod can revoke you. But otherwise, you've got the job for a year, and you can wreak havoc and go well, do do what you think is your agenda. It's uh, but yeah, they can't directly tell you what to do. This is one thing I've kind of noticed is like as I've kind of, I kind of moved between different circles of different political influence as I've been playing the game. Like never really dedicating to any one of them, but kind of getting a general idea of what the the executive kind of world is. And I find it absolutely fascinating how these different groups are all separate and how they kind of operate but yet they are so deeply reliant on each other to get results uh, to make their jobs easier you know yeah absolutely i think that there's when i can't speak for every other general because i don't follow them more like a stalker but the um <laughs> as far as they know that makes you yeah honestly immediately suspicious who made who has to mention that they're not a stalker like if you're mentioning it it's a bad sign <laughs> it probably is so but I, the way that I'd like to operate is that I've got key contacts in the other imperial bodies that I talk to. So I've got my favourite senators that I go and talk to. I've got a couple of cardinals that I know well that I talk to and try to get the synod on board with things. Because it's one of those things where their area, all of the areas of the game in fact impact each other. And there was a big phase where the synod were repeatedly causing havoc in the military game by doing things, sort of giving religious decrees that would have massive knock-on effects on us. Mm -hmm. And talking talking to the synod players in advance really makes that one more fun when it does happen and slightly better more likely that you can control it uh are you just admitting right now that you're part of the deep state yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i like this though i get this uh i'm not really into like the 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 how would i even how would i even describe what i'm trying to describe right now what i'm trying to describe are the the different groups that exist in empire and they stretch between the, some of them are in one nation some of those like tendrils will go to other nations and there's like uh there's like these they're almost like like gangster mafiosi control groups right that like things can seem very democratic from the surface but then very much if you just scratch the surface you're like this whole place is locked down by like the these certain groups and i, I find it a really interesting but not in like a way that there's one group controlling all of Empire. It's many different groups vying. And there's like the yeah. randomness of chaos within that. So their plans might be that someone's going to get elected to this. And that might be completely thrown out by a very random set of occurrences. Uh, or, or another rival group moving against them. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it comes down to... From what I've, I've seen of them, there's, there are a bunch of these cabals doing things. Mm. And a lot of them have got an agenda. It's not necessarily about... I Cabal. Get this guy elected to a job. But I think what you have a lot of is people have a vision that's like, no, we're going to focus on wipe out the Druze, take the Barons, do this, you no, know, secure the West of the Empire, wipe out the Valorn. People have got a vision for like a really core goals they want to achieve. Mm. But they will get cross nation support from people that share those goals. And, it, or it, possibly they don't share your goals, but you've got compatible ones. Yeah, and I think that's very interesting that you say a goal is something. I think a goal is a great mm. motivator in LARP. Like to something that you or other people are very much interested in seeing happen really adds to kind of and that's basically why i'm still being involved in the, the political game effectively i want something to happen ergo i need to be involved in it to try and make that happen within this world of different counterpoints and pulleys that are all happening with the different characters running around it's um it's it's going to be interesting i think 
also trying to measure your expectation and learn when you go to different areas in it. So, for example, if you want to be involved in the military game, which we should try and stay focused on, um, going along and watching and finding out what's going on and making personal contact with the different people involved is a great start, right? And then trying to basically say, I want this to happen for these reasons to a general might be your first step on your military career, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. speaking for myself, I would rather pull out my own teeth than go to the military council not knowing anybody or what's going on to start with. Because you're not allowed to talk unless you're a general or you're called on by the, the herald of the, who's the civil servant who runs the meetings. Right. Kind of there having to bite your teeth and not say anything unless you want to heckle. A lot of, it's a lot like the Senate, right? With the, where people yeah. can't talk from the... Yeah, okay. So, and if you're there and you've got really strong opinions and you can't say anything and you can't influence the meeting, and you, you think, especially if you're watching and you're thinking, I could do a better job than this. It can be really frustrating. And the, I, ideally, what you want is to find an angle in so that when you go to that first meeting, you're going with someone probably who will introduce you to a few people. And there's a whole bunch of those. I mean, during the year where, for political reasons, I wasn't a general, um, various people that sort of agitated to have me removed from the job for a year. And I became an adjutant for someone else, for Natalia of the Tower Jacks. And what I discovered was there was this wonderful, what I called adjutants club, which is like this little cabal of all the people <laughs> sitting on the back benches who can't talk. What? And yeah, they, we, we, sh we share stories and beer and wine. Oh God, yeah, they're, they're, they're like a that little is the most, of their own. That is the most empire thing ever, is a... I love this self-forming group thing that happens at Empire yeah. of like, we're all adjutants, we all can't say anything, we're all going to meet up, have a few drinks and tell stories. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, also, so, yeah, I mean, people we... like, when you have like a massive argument, it's a public thing, where if, if you're the general, you're the public face of your nation's policy. So if, you're, if you go out there as the Navarre general, you cannot go out to a meeting and publicly say, well... I think we should do the Navar do the Valorn later, actually. You know, it's not the biggest priority right now. Let's go let's put that on the back burner. Because your own nation will lynch you. And so you've got to say the party line sometimes. So often what happens is behind the scenes, for one one nation or another, we'll have their adjutants have a chat about the stuff that the generals can't actually be seen to publicly talk about it, and they sound each other out. And I, I loved it. You've got this whole level of That's awesome. politics going on. Like that that for me is like uh, that's why I'm starting to really love these aspects to Empire is these uh, these structures. They seem to, and I think there must be something, because I came in when there was the big player wave that happened a couple of years mm -hmm. ago where there was a big influx of players uh, thanks to uh, Mark Humes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine what it must have been like being a player at that time, especially if you spent years playing it, where the game was a certain size and scale and then it, elevated up to what it is now oh God, um, over it. a course of yeah and i can only imagine because yeah, that, that would be my assumption when i first came in i felt some hesitancy like there was almost like oh well maybe i it, maybe maybe there's an embarrassment to being part of that new wave or even you listening to this if you are a new player going to empire and i think there's something to be said that that's not strictly true because these things scale and game is created under or part of existing structures or, or hierarchies. And some of them are really interesting, like really interesting. Like uh, a good example would be um, the healers in Navarre are the, now their own archetype. They're their own thing. They, they have their own group and they self-organize and they were doing that before, right? It's, it's because it became, and now it's part of the game that that's a thing. I think that's a good example. Yeah. Well, the game gets so much richer with more people. I mean, some people don't like Festlarp. They some people prefer to play much smaller scale games where they can feel more like they've got more attention from the plot writers, or they can feel like they have a big impact on the world because there's only ten players. So by definition, you've got that much spotlight time. And mm. I love Festlarp, but I think Festlarp benefits from having a, a lot of people. And I think well, I talked to loads of players I knew when we had this big influx, and we were every single one of us was just really excited about it. Mm. I think there's, but uh, I like the reason why I like Festlarp as well is because I, I can be anonymous at Festlarp. I know obviously doing the podcast, obviously not many people know what I look like. So that, that can be a factor to that, which has never come up. But what I mean is I like the fact is that if I want to go and just play the game and I just want to walk around and enjoy the, the ambience of the place and grab a beer in a couple of different tents along the way and meet a couple of interesting characters, that can be a well worthwhile empire experience for a, a for for as many events as you want to go to but if you really want to get into it there are 
many structures and groups and characters to explore influence and take part in which i just mm -hmm. it's it's fascinating yeah. you know so you can you can you can sort of paddle around on the shore if you want to or yeah. you can swim a little bit deeper and and see if the sharks get you oh there are sharks out there as well though phil aren't there my lord yeah but, uh, but no, it's a it's a game of many layers, and the game creates games. So it's 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 really interesting. There's a very human factor to this as well, right? Like the reason why it's so fascinating is because it is like, what's the term I, that I found fascinating? Uh, politically PR, uh, um, uh, what's it called? PVP'd, politically mm. PVP'd someone, and I find that like I found that like a wow, that's a really interesting term. And that can be on a, I mean, you can take that as being like a, an assault or whatever, and it's a really bad thing. But at the same time, there's there's fun in that, that it's all human beings interacting. And basically, if there was a hive mind playing the Empire, I'm sure the Empire would win all the time, right? Like, but because we're so divided and individual, there's all sorts of wonderful directions that, that the whole world can take on, right? And we're dictating that. I think it's, I think it's amazing. Yeah, and the game is very much set up with agency as a core thing where um, early on various players wanted to have more of a top-down approach to how the game was played. What they wanted to have was sort of faction leaders and generals who would just dictate everyone else what they did. So they, you might go, I'm the general of Navarre, I've, you've all got military units so you'll do what I say. And that's absolutely not what the game is set up for. But you know, PD have really pushed back against that so that they, they want every single player to go, no, you've got complete agency, no one can tell you what to do. You might, mm -hmm. They can persuade you, you can, and you can choose to do the, go along with them or someone else, but you, at the end of the day, you've got your complete control over your stuff. No one else can I order you. I talked to a friend of mine, um, yeah, I won't say who, uh, someone I've met at Empire, and we just had a really fun conversation talking about flipping the table. And what I mean by that is, like, what, what if you wanted, because we live in an age of um populist governments and all the rest of it and political activism and there's a lot of history for this but looking at those and, and like what lessons can we learn from real life politics and real politic and put into empire like what if a group of people really did just want to flip the table on the empire and tear down systems or structures i think like you could make something like that i don't know how pd would react but i think there would be room in the game for all sorts of very interesting mechanisms you know yeah. and we've definitely had people play overtly anti-empire groups and there was a group of friends of mine who played anarchy cultists who were in dawn and they were explicitly trying to do great damage to the empire in particular the marches so they were cursing well, the heck of march say, land. i wouldn't even say that your average revolutionary believes they are doing harm though potentially right like your intention isn't to do mm -hmm. harm it's to change oh yeah um, no, it's the I, different the... agendas are right very much competing so you can absolutely sabotage they, yourself yeah, exactly and therefore i mean you could look at certain like objectives or aims or actions that are actually counterproductive to the empire but could be seen as necessary for political change and that's i, I mean it's really interesting that or, side of things or or religious change let's not forget or that. religious change very much so phil yeah absolutely yeah the um yeah, the religion game is a, is a fascinating one. And to think about how much it's changed over the years. And uh, the, 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 I think there's room in there to kind of be very sectish. Obviously, it's very illegal, very heretical, but the, 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 there is room in the game for that, right? Yeah, you don't even have to be a heresy. I mean, oh, there, there have been some great heresy cults, but mm. some of the extreme groups have been wonderful. Um, and the, the one that always comes to my mind was, not, was a very short-lived high guard group called Vashti's Penitents who came in with a very strong brief to play part of the High Guard brief, absolutely to the hilt, as extreme as they could <laughs> make it. And so they were religious Kill fanatics who <laughs> believed that the realms were a terrible influence on humanity and human destiny, and that you should stop the realms influencing. So being High Guard, they were all what they call unveiled, lineaged people who hate the fact they're lineaged. They try to destroy their own lineage trapping, so they file off their own horns and that sort of thing. So, oh my god. They, they were fairly creepy. Um, but one of the things they wanted to do is, at the time, um, heralds, the, the, the magical servants of the Eternals, who can come, because the Eternals yeah. they have a huge influence, but they can't come to the real world. So they can send their heralds to do their bidding. But at the time, heralds had no legal protection at all, because they aren't people. So what Vashti's penitents worked out they could do is they could stop the realms influencing the Empire by killing all the heralds. <laughs> so every time one turned up with some <laughs> objective, and they could, they would job them. 
Um, and this what? huge impact where suddenly Conclave, who has a vast proportion of people who want to talk to heralds, want to deal with the realms, want to be magical power, you've got this bunch of fanatics who are within the law utterly ruining all their plans. Brilliant. It was great. Yeah. The law got changed Brilliant. after then. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the heralds got legal protection after the Vashti's penitents were wiped out. I like that though. That's like when you look at true crime for the 1970s and you're like, no DNA? You mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they don't have a fingerprint database? Like, wow, I could rob a bank here and get away with that over here, you know? Like, um, yeah, that's very much like that. Amazing. Right, gents, we've been talking for a little while now, so I think we better call it to an end. Um, Tim, Phil, thank you so much for coming on and talking. It's been really, really fun talking to you guys, and I've learned an awful lot. So hopefully if anyone's listening and they did learn, because I hope that was very obvious that I knew nothing about any of it before we tied. And now I feel fairly well informed, I think. So well done, boys. I think that's really good. I think I've loved the chance to froth about Empire after a long gap. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's, too, it's too long. It's too long. Do you know what, though? This conversation's really helped rally my spirits, actually, talking about it. It's like... Um, it's it's tough talking about Empire when we're still a ways away and it's been a while, but um, the dream is still there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's uh, it's very much there, and uh, I look forward to doing it on the field. Basically, it's going to be good. Um, yeah. Right. So uh, quickly, let me just thank our patrons who are long suffering. I have um, been pausing uh, the monthly contribution uh, contribute con what's that word? contribution um to the podcast recently um basically because we haven't been releasing that many episodes as i'm sure you can imagine it's been very difficult at this time with the the virus and everything and also my own um levels of uh hype for larp and i don't really want to fake it when we do do it so uh, i'm sure you can appreciate that we have had some technical issues which has been annoying obviously doing over uh, skype has been difficult um but we will uh hopefully have i've got some really interesting stuff coming up basically so uh, like this one so uh thank you all very much for listening and uh i hope you're doing well and uh thanks a lot for joining us uh goodbye here you go lovely local blend this made it myself thank you mm, yarp. so uh, what is it that brings you to two staff <laughs> have you come to make your fortune and bring down the beast that stalks the swamp no we aren't here for prosperity rather loyalty we're looking for an old friend Ah, uh, spoken like a true follower of the way. Wonderful. Does this friend have a name? John Miller. M- Miller? John Miller? Oh, well, I'm afraid I've got some very bad news for you. He died a few weeks ago. What? I'm I'm so very sorry to tell you. But, but how? Well, um, John lived out past Fenny Ridge. Uh, we didn't see him for a few days, and I went out to check on him, and... Well, it seems he was taken like the others. We, um... We don't often find a body. Then we're too late. If only I'd opened his letter sooner. He wrote to you? He did, asking for aid. Hmm. I mean, perhaps he knew he was in danger. I'd warned him to stay in the town after dark, but, well, if John was anything, he was stubborn. Indeed he was. Listen, it's not much, but why don't you stay here for the night? You want to be rested for your journey home tomorrow, surely? Yes, thank you. That would be very kind of you. Um... If you would excuse me, I'm going to go outside to smoke my pipe.